Um, uh, let's see that. Um, this is going to be a shared session between myself and uh, Jason Nicholas, the Director of Institutional Effectiveness here at uh, NMU. And I will introduce Jason before his uh, portion of the presentation. Uh, this presentation came out that we were just talking about challenges. It's something we talk a lot about at Northern, is the challenges of enrollment uh, in the future. Uh, because there, and, and Jason will tell you all about that, the challenges that we face with uh, Northern's enrollment in the future. Um, but it really also uh, sparked for me in really thinking about how Northern's enrollment changed in the past and how we became this university that we are today. And so this is uh, going to look at both the past, the present, and the future uh, with regards to enrollment at Northern. Uh, start here. Oh, I love this picture on the top, which is, you probably can't see it very, from way, way in back, but that is from the 1917 summer session here at Northern. Actually, back then, there were more students who attended in the summertime than attended in the, uh, the uh, academic year because so many of them were one-room schoolhouse teachers who were teaching throughout the year, and they would come for training in the summer. Uh, in fact, a few years after this, my grandmother started in that program. And then down on the right is from 1965, uh, in Hedgecock Fieldhouse, the opening day of the school year, uh, which at that time was the largest class in Northern history. So this graph um, is really what I want to talk about, or at least a portion of this graph. This, uh, I went through the records at uh, the archives, enemy archives, to determine what the uh, enrollment was at Northern from as wide a swath as I could find. This is the enrollment numbers I found for Northern from 1906 to 1983. And as you can see, Northern size really until, uh, really until the late 1940s and then the mid 1950s was fairly stable. And then all of a sudden you see this like ski jump going upward into the stratosphere. Uh, going from less than 1,000 students to over 9,000 students by the 1970s, late 1970s. Uh, and the period I really want to talk about is this period from 1957 to 1967, which was really a crucial period and where Northern really decided what it was going to become and how it was going to get there. And there were more, many forces that led that to happen. And that's always what, what people ask is why? What happened? How did that enrollment just kick up so, you know, largely going from less than 1,000 students to over 7,000 students in basically uh, a little over a decade? First, I want to drop back a little bit to the post-war period. Um, during World War II, uh, enrollment had dropped to about 210 students. Only 14 of them were men in the fall of 1943. That makes sense. Most of the men were either in the military or working in, um, in, uh, in the factories or were in the mines uh, as part of the war effort. Um, but, of course, as soon as the war was over, uh, attendance jumped precipitously to 903 in the fall of 1946. 633 men and 297 women. This was only the third year in Northern's history that men outnumbered women at, at Northern. Men outnumbered men, it says here, no, men outnumbered women. Uh, the previous years were 1938 and 39. And the main reason for this increase is all the soldiers returning from the war uh, and having the GI Bill, which was going to pay for their education through their service in the military. And this boom would really continue through, the, uh, through 1950 when these uh, men all started graduating. So in the early 50, nor 50s, Northern's enrollment drops again. Uh, and this is due to the graduation of those World War II veterans and also the Korean War. It was during this period, during the Korean War in the beginning of the 1950s, that Northern's enrollment dropped by 45%. Uh, actually, it began in 1949, but it would continue through the war and into the, into the 1950s. It dropped for both men and women. Um, 
And this is after the state had already paid for Cary Hall, which was the first women's dorm at Northern, or the second to first was by St. Um, Mike's Church, uh, which is no longer there. Uh, the Lee Hall Student Union and the Olson Library, which was attached to the Peter White Science Building. And the men's dorm was in the process of being built, which we now know as Spooner Hall. Uh, other colleges in, the, in Michigan, however, at this time were growing, but Northern was really stagnating and even dropping in its enrollment. Uh, and for this reason, uh, like the Hedgecock Fieldhouse, which they ha had first been planning in 1950 with the state, would take over eight years for it to be built and opened. Uh, when President Hardin, Edgar Hardin, took over office in 1956, he was told by Clifford Morrison, the state rep from the Eastern UP, that Northern should be closed. Uh, and evidently, others in Lansing felt exactly the same way as Morrison did. The, the feeling in Lansing was, Northern's not going to make it. Uh, there's not enough of a populace up there. There's not enough of a draw. Um, we should probably think of closing it or consolidating it. And the state superintendent, Dr. Lee Thurston, felt that Northern had to make a decision. It was either going to expand or it was going to close. And that seems to be always the case with universities. You're either growing or you're shrinking and maybe out of business. Uh, it was at this time Dr. Edgar Hardin came in 1956, um, and he had a lot of ambitions for Northern's growth. He saw incredible potential. He saw one of the key things is that Northern's administration was pretty weak in size, and, and so he, he uh, hired the first vice president um, and a director of public services, a consultant for the guidance office, and a new dean for women. Up to that time, Ethel Carey had been the dean of women. There was a dean of men and a dean of women. She had been a dean of women since the 1920s. Uh, and there are lots of stories about Ethel Carey. She, I mean, they named a hall for her. She was very popular in some respects. In other respects, she was very, very strict. Um, and they needed to shake it up a little bit. Um, Maybe Northern's reputation, her reputation, was maybe hurting Northern's attracting students because she was so strict. Uh, enrollment had increased by the fall of 1956 when Hardin took over to over 1,000 students. So Hardin gets all the credit oftentimes for Northern's growth. And he certainly played a role in that. But by that time he came in, Northern's uh, enrollment had been increasing slowly since 1952. So there was something going on already. But from the fall of 1956 to the fall of 1967, uh, which is the year that he, uh, he finally retired, Northern would grow 550% in size, from 1,090 to 7,085 students. But the question is, why? What was going on? Well, the Korean War ended in July of 1953, so you had a bunch of new men with uh, the GI Bills in their pocket who wanted to enter college. But I think just as important to that, maybe even more important, was the third generation immigrant story. The third generation immigrants, unlike their grandparents or parents, were young people who did not want to work in the mines, the farms, and the factories, the woods, or labor professions. They wanted professional jobs. In fact, their parents wanted them to get out of those jobs as well. They didn't, uh, the expectation wasn't that your kids were going to continue to do the work you were doing. You wanted them to get a college education. You wanted them to become professionals. So you had a whole generation of immigrants, grandchildren, and children who wanted something more than life and labor. There was also economic growth. In 1955, Detroit produced more than 40% more automobiles than the year before. And though there are some recession dips in the 1950s in general, Michigan's economy is booming in the, in the mid, late, and especially in the 1960s. And so a thriving economy translates into a greater tax revenue for investment in education. Now, Edgar Hardin does deserve a lot of credit for Northern's growth in this period. Um, and it was in 1957 that he wrote in the NMU Bulletin uh, an article saying that higher education should be ac accessible to all who have sufficient mental, physical, and moral competence to profit from an opportunity to attend college. And by the 1960s, this has become what people are calling the right to try policy, and it is synonymous with Northern. Uh, and uh, in fact, this picture on the right um, 
which says right the try in the bottom is from the yearbook, I think from 1965. So students very much uh, recognize that this, and I talked to students who went to college at that time and even into the 1970s, uh, that right to try was a very important part of the reason that they came to Northern. Uh, other colleges probably wouldn't have given them a chance. Northern was willing to do so, and this has a huge impact on the number of students that come. Another thing that uh, Hardin felt very strongly about was athletics. Uh, Northern, by the 1950s, all of its sports teams were coached by the same guy, C.V. Money, uh, who was also the athletic director. So Northern did not have a very professional look at athletics as an extracurricular activity. There were scholarships for athletes, but in general, the coaches were uh, pretty utilitarian coaches. Uh, Harden decided to hire professional coaches such as Stan Elbeck, who went on to coach in the NBA, and Frosty Forzaka for football, with the idea of expanding the programs and creating more regional awareness of the school. And so, from that period, from 1957 to 1967, the team sizes and the number of sports grows exponentially, though only for men. Women would not have athletic teams at Northern until the early 1970s. Um, and it was also bringing in more athletes from outside of Michigan. Uh, so this was one of the th reasons for the athletic program was let's attract students from outside of the UP, from outside of Michigan, Northern Wisconsin, and they were. They were starting to attract a wider student body it was getting more regional awareness to Northern, having an athletic program that was, uh, and, and increasingly uh, successful athletic programs as well. Now I bring this up because my parents in many ways represented these things that Hardin was talking about, or the, the main reasons why Northern grew at this time. Uh, my father on the right there uh, was from Marquette. He was a Korean War veteran. I uh, had worked for a while in Milwaukee, and decided to come to Northern to get his degree. I think he started in 1957 at Northern. Uh, he was a third generation immigrant. His parents had been working class people. His family had always been working class, both in the Lake Superior Ishming Railroad and in the lumbering industry here in Marquette. And then my mom on the right here, uh, Suzette Marie Gollinger was from Munising. Also, she was the children of Canadian immigrants, or a child of Canadian immigrants, who wanted her not to be stuck in the labor cycle that they had been in. Her mother had worked at a plywood factory in Munising until she was laid off. Um, and so they wanted her to go to college, and she was the first person. Oh, well, her father did go to uh, Ferris State, that's right. But uh, she attended and became an English teacher at Graverett High School for several years. Um, and that's them in the middle. They were decide Northern used uh, them as the model couple when they built the married student housing at Northern, uh, which is behind Spooner Hall, was behind Spooner Hall. It's now a parking lot. And that's my father at the top there uh, because originally they lived in the uh, barracks, the old army barracks that was known as Vetville here at Northern. Sorry. But they're a perfect example of this, this growth that's going on at Northern at that time. Now, there are other reasons for growth, and I call this the chicken and the egg syndrome. Was it Northern's building boom, or was it the baby boom that led to the building boom? And this is an important thing. There's a great physical expansion that takes place in this period of time. The Hedgecock Building opens in 1958. The University Center in three uh, phases, 60, 64, and 66. Greece and West Residence Halls in 1960, 61. The Thomas Fine Arts and Forest Roberts Theater in 1963. Uh, the Quad One Residence Halls, 64, 65. Quad Two in 66. West Science in 1966. And then Jamrich Hall in the Learning Resources Center, or now Hardin Hall in 1969. This is a massive expansion program. And the really question is, was this what drove students to come here? Was the expansion? Or were we expanding because students were coming here in larger numbers? It's probably a little bit of both. Northern's trying to accommodate. In fact, one of the jokes was that they built the quad uh, residence halls before West Science, which meant that students had to walk several 
uh, you know, like half a mile to classes through a muddy field uh, because they hadn't built the academic core of the university yet. It was still far away from where the, they knew the dormitories were going to be. So they put up the dorms first because they had the students that they had to house, but they didn't have the classroom space for them yet. So the Northern was trying to keep up with this thing that we now know as the baby boom. The baby boom is only partially involved, I think, the, part of the reason for this growth, um, because really the baby boom does not kick in until 1964. The first children are really born in 1946, so it isn't until 64 they've graduated from high school and they're starting to come to college. Uh, but what we do see in this period of time is that in all of the colleges across the state of Michigan, huge growth. Um, it's a little small in the, on the bottom there, but on the far left is Eastern uh, Michigan, the next is Central Michigan, the third is Western, and then Northern. Uh, this is uh, 1950 numbers, 1960 numbers, and 1970 numbers. So you can see absolutely massive growth in all the state's universities at this time. And just to look at it as a percentage, though Northern had, was the smallest of the colleges, it had the highest percentage increase during that same period of time. This may have had something to do with the right to try policy, which was something different that Northern had that the others did not. Um, and that may have been part of the reason for Northern's huge growth at that time. Another thing that came up in my research was the really the importance of the Vietnam War and growth of especially men going into college at this time. Uh, if you look at the numbers nationally, you will see that there is a huge increase or a marketed increase of young men going to college to get deferment from the Vietnam War draft. Um, and if you look at the numbers, I don't have the numbers for men and women in 1966, which is why that's blank. But starting in 1964, when the United States enters full-fledged into the conflict until 1973, this shows basically the growth of students at Northern based on men and women. The light green is men, the dark green is women. And where in those first few years of the war, we definitely see a big increase in men, it stabilizes after 1967 for the most part. And actually, there's an increase of women who are coming to Northern at this time. So I'm not sure at Northern how much influence the Vietnam War uh, deferment of the draft was throughout the war, maybe at the very beginning. But throughout the rest of the war, I'm not sure how much of an impact that had on uh, enrollment. So my conclusion is that, one, I think the biggest thing is that there's a growing middle class in America, a middle class that wants to get out of working in uh, labor roles in the United States like their parents and grandparents did. Economic growth in Michigan and the United States in general. Hardens right to try policies. Athletics uh, for men uh, had some impact. State of Michigan, Northern's investments in new facilities. The baby boom after 1964. Possibly the Vietnam War draft uh, only from 1964 to 67. Uh, but I think as we see with that huge influx of women coming to college in the late 60s, I think it's a changing identity roles for women in society. Um, my mother came here in the 1950s. She got her degree. She started teaching. But as soon as my father and her got married and she had a child, she was expected to stop working. By the late 60s, that starts to change. You see women who are saying, no, I'm not going to give up a career just because I have kids. My mother-in-law, who was a few years after her, decided not to. She raised her family while working as a teacher. So there was a huge change that was going on here at that time and everywhere in the country at that time with women's roles in the workplace. And so I'd like to acknowledge Russ Minyagi, who, who wrote the report on the possible closure of Northern back in 1997, Miriam Hilton for her book on Northern's 57 year, uh, 75 years, and the NMU archives for their help with this presentation. So now I'd like to bring up Jason Nicholas, who is going to talk about um, enrollment now. Jason received his bachelor's degree in psychology from Minnesota State University in Moorhead. 
his master's in applied psychology with a focus on a program evaluation and industrial organizational psychology at University of Wisconsin Stout. He worked for the Wisconsin Cooperative Education Services Agency in Chippewa Falls and also at the Applied Research Center uh, in the Institutional Research Office at Stout. And he is currently the Director of Institutional Effectiveness at Northern, overseeing uh, institutional research duties, including state and federal reporting, data, data analytics, and lots of other stuff that I could go on and on. And he's also our uh, Assistant Provost, I believe. So would you please welcome uh, Jason Nicholas? There you go. Thank you. Well, thank you, everybody. Give me just a moment to get my presentation up. It's so interesting to to see Dan's presentation because we focus so much in my office on sort of the current enrollment and future enrollment, but it, it's, there's so many echoes in the past and in particular the social influences that really have an impact on enrollment and, and we'll get into a little bit of that uh, here as we look forward with enrollment at Northern. So Dan covered most of what we do in my intro. Um, as he said, I'm the Director of Institutional Effectiveness, uh, Assistant Provost. Uh, it, we've just recently retitled the Office Institutional Effectiveness, and, and it's really because we've been growing over the last four or five years and adding a number of different services that we provide to the university. Um, it started out as institutional research where we did mostly federal and state reporting and a lot of the census for the university, sort of those uh, yearly statistics, enrollment, completion rates, things like that. A lot of surveys, focus projects, um, but then we started growing and taking care of the university's accreditation responsibilities with the Higher Learning Commission. Uh, we started doing university assessment support for learning and co-curricular assessment. <coughs> Recently been growing into student success analytics and all of this kind of ties into uh, enrollment projections. So I'm just going to jump right to the end of the presentation and show you what everything looks like uh, for the foreseeable future. So if this is all you kind of came to check out, then uh, you're welcome to take off after this, because we're going to get into the details of why these lines are going the way they are. The blue line represents sort of the most recent history, going back to about 2010. And you can see some significant changes there. The break in those lines is kind of where we're at right now. <coughs> and then the orange line is kind of where we're projecting the university's enrollment should nothing change, which obviously that's not going to hold true. Things are going to change dramatically. But if status quo holds, that's about where we expect things to be going. So what does that represent? Looking forward till about 2037, 36, 37, we are anticipating about a 10% decline in the overall headcount. And that's mainly driven by demographic changes that are going on, and, and we'll get into those in just a moment. Um, the rest of it, though, when you kind of stack it all up since 2010, really puts together a, a pretty significant decline in the university over the last well, if we, if we end up in, at 6,500 around 2037, 30% decline will be a pretty significant step backwards in enrollment uh, over that period of time. So, you know, a lot of the, the changes in the blue lines in the early 2010s are things that I wasn't here. I can't really speak too intentionally about what was going on there, but I know that there was, um, there was significant change going on as we were coming out of the recession, 2008, 2010 recession. Oftentimes when you have a recession, there is a little bit of growth in uh, like one and two year programs, uh, tech and vocational programs, but the traditional four year programs are oftentimes a little bit uh, out of people's price range for, for those economic crunch times. So we'll usually see a decline in those four year programs and Northern's four year programs make up about 80% of our enrollment. There were other things that were going on during that time as well. We had a number of different uh, leadership changes in the early part of that decade. I think three presidents in a short amount of time whether those were positive or negative influences, I won't speak to that, but certainly that change um, would have had an influence there. And then there were also a number of different rebranding efforts that were going on during that time. And when, when I talked to some of my colleagues, it, they, some of those may have kind of missed the mark a little bit. So all of that contributes to sort of that big decline, that 20% decline since 2010. But then we, we add that into what we're looking at into the future. And there's, there's significant challenges at the university when it comes to enrollment. And um, so, you know, so what's going on here? <clears throat> right now, sort of that current landscape is there, there's just, there's so many things. There's so many things influencing our enrollment right now and, and moving forward. 
This is just sort of a collection of a number of them that kind of are things that we pay attention to on a regular basis. So obviously student um, physical and mental health, there's interstate migration with populations of people moving between states, the coasts are becoming so expensive, people moving across states, political factors, high school graduation rates have a really big impact for us, regional economic factors, national economic factors. Um, over you know, the last 30 or 40 years, there's been a reduction in state appropriations. And lots of questions about the val value of a college education and, and tuition increases. So for us as researchers for the university, trying to better understand what's happening, you know, this is, this is kind of the soup that we're trying to pick apart. Um, and, and some of these things are a little easier to sort of quantify than others, but the ones in particular that I want to focus on, you know, COVID obviously in the last couple of years has had a bit of big impact. Um, and, and two years ago, we had a 15% decline in new freshman enrollment. Luckily this year, we had a really nice freshman class. We were up about 10%, but we're still sort of at a net loss of 5% over the last couple of years. But really that little one, fertility rates, is probably the sneakiest of them all and probably has the biggest impact on things for us um, moving forward. So, so what do I mean by that? So during the Great Recession, heading up to the Great Recession, the total fertility rate in the nation um, was, was strong. The, the replacement rate for, for the U.S. population is about 2.1. So what that means is for every um, mother who's entering childbearing years, child rearing years, they need to have about 2.1 babies per mother in order for us to sort of outpace that mortality rate uh, at the national level. Um, and you can see in 2007, on the way up to the Great Recession, this, the, the country was doing fairly well in, in sort of achieving that replacement rate. There were only a handful of pockets sort of up in the, the upper northeast part of the country where there were starting to see some decline, but for the most part, the rest of the country was, was meeting or exceeding those numbers in some places doing uh, even stronger than 2.1. So then 2008 hits. The recession takes its toll on the country in, in a, a multitude of different ways. And as that starts to settle in, changes happen in families, family dynamics. People are putting off having children till later or not having as many. The fertility rate starts to fall and really starts to hit kind of a, a, a significant decline over the next 10 years. So that map, that same map we were just looking at that was all blue in 2007 or nearly all blue is now all red or orange. And what that means is that those orange and red states are the ones that are below that 2.1 replacement rate. So that map changed dramatically. If you look at going from those blues to that red, and they actually ended up having to add a new category on there for below 20% below that replacement rate. So they're, this, at this point, the average replacement rate for the nation is about 1.6. So that's a significant, very significant decline. So. Here's a little bit longer view of that. Same kind of thing, going back to the 40s and sort of overlapping a lot of the work that Dan was just sharing with us. The baby boomer generation really drove a lot of that growth. Look at that replacement rate was not quite four in the 50s and 60s. So it's really easy to see a lot of the sort of demographic or environmental factors that were driving enrollment. We get into generation Y in the 80s and the 90s, starting to pick back up a little bit. You get to that 2007 point where, you, where we were showing that map in blue, just creeps above that line after it was down for a while. And then the recession hits and it really starts to tank, it starts to go downward. So what does that mean for us? If we look at the state of Michigan, Michigan students, Northern's enrollment is made up about 80% Michigan students. It used to be close to 50% where UP, it's a, around 40% now, it's a little bit more 40, percent UP, 40% downstate, and about 20% out of state. But if we look at the, those Michigan numbers for the students, uh, residents who are under the age of 18, you can see, I, I showed the whole scale, but if we, if we cut that in half, that line would look a little bit more dramatic, but that's a 9% decline going from, boy, I can't even read my numbers, 2000 to 2010. So we're starting to see the impacts of the recession in those population numbers. And if we look at segments of these population ranges, age five to 11 or so, the declines are even more obvious. 
So what does that mean for us at Northern? So we work a lot with um, data and reports that come from a group called the Western Interstate Commission for Higher Education. They are a West Coast uh, nonprofit that takes a look at sort of these kinds of issues and a number of other issues that really impact higher education. Um, but this one in particular is a publication they put out every few years called Knocking at the College Door. And what they do is they take this idea of you know, how, how these demographic changes happen and they look at where those impacts are happening in K-12 data. So you can kind of get a sense of where we're gonna be at, at the university by watching how those class sizes are changing in the K-12 world. So these guys at Wichi do a really great job of breaking these numbers down nationwide. They break them down regionally. They also break them down statewide. And you can really get a sense here of sort of what that trend line has looked like over the last few years as they translate some, some of those um, demographic and economic numbers into projections for the number of high school graduates. So this isn't necessarily the number of graduates going to college, but it's the number of graduates um, coming out of high school. So, in a sense, it's, it's kind of the size of our market. So you can see, if we take all of those impacts from 2007 through 2017, and, and just on a side note, those fertility rates have not recovered. They're staying down low, and, and there really isn't any uh, recovery in sight. If you, if you search for uh, fertility replacement rate uh, and Brookings Institute, you'll find a recent publication that really goes into depth on, on some of that topic, if that's of interest to you. But they take that information and they kind of throw it forward for us and give us a sense of what those trend lines are going to look like uh, as we think about the number of high school graduates. So if you look and see from 1992 through 2037, 2037, uh, similar, eight, you know, go back 18 years from that, and that's right around this recession, the end of the recession. That's when we expect to see some of those uh, declines really starting to bottom out. That cliff starts at about 2025. So go back 18 years from there, you're around 2007-ish, right at the beginning of the recession. So it's all, all kind of tied together. So we've been paying attention to this research for a long time. Um, this is one of those things that, um, you know, it, it, this work is so impactful for not only us, but for, for in higher education as an industry um, to get a sense of what we need to be looking at down the road. So, if we take a look at some of the Michigan numbers, you can see the same kinds of, same kinds of concerns in the Michigan numbers. Uh, the black line here is the grand total of both public and private. The blue line is the public schools, all of them following a very similar trend line, again, um, from that witchy knocking at the college door source. So that brings us back to NMU's enrollment in the recent past and then moving forward. So again, this is, this is status quo. This is what we expect based on just changes to the size of our market, the number of students, um, which you just recently re-updated their knocking at the college door and, and these projections got quite a bit more optimistic. And that's because there's so many efforts in so many other places that have an impact on the, these lines. So for example, a lot of the work around um, graduation, uh, graduation rates in high school, those graduation rates have been consistently going up. So the more students that are graduating, the more that has an impact on our market. So we were actually expecting more like a 12 to 15% decline over the next 15 years until they updated those numbers and now it's more in that 10 to 12 range. But again, that's just if things sort of hold steady and there's, there's any number of those factors I showed at the beginning that could really move these numbers up or down. So, so what does all of this mean for us, right? We're aware of this, we know these things are coming. What are we doing to sort of get ready for sustained, prolonged enrollment decline? Um, I can only speak to a few different things, but there's a lot that we've been doing. Uh, in particular, a couple years ago, sort of when this, this topic really uh, jumped up nationally, um, was around a, uh, uh, some work by an economist, uh, nationally renowned economist, Dr. Nathan Grah, who is from Carleton College in Minnesota. He wrote a book called Demographics and the Demand for Higher Education. And he took a lot of that witchy data and he took a lot of the K-12 data. <laughs> He's an economist, so he factored in things like migration and, and race and ethnicity. 
And he put together a, a number, a series of projections for regions and, and by market, uh, and did a lot of work uh, in this space. I had the great fortune of seeing him present a couple times on the topic and, and started a conversation with him, was able to bring him to campus. I wanted to make sure that, that for Northern, that I wasn't the only one running around trying to share this message. I didn't want to be chicken little and, and telling everybody that the sky is falling. I wanted this to be something that was backed up by a number of different experts. So, so we had Dr. Grata campus, we had a few public presentations, uh, in, internal meetings, and, and had a chance to really pick his brain and get a sense of this. So we know that this is coming, and we believe that this is something that we're gonna be facing as challenges for the universities, for the universities. So it's also been included in a lot of our strategic planning documents and initiatives. It's a central focus there. In 2019, in December of 2019, the board made significant investments in student success initiatives. And one of the ways that we think that we can sort of mitigate this decline, we can do it a couple different ways. We can do it through additional um, admissions, recruiting additional students. But we can also do it by better serving the students that we have. We're doing a good job. We're, our retention rate, so what I mean by that is the number of students who show up in the freshman year who are still here at the beginning of the sophomore year. We do a pretty good rate when we benchmark against the rest of our Michigan peers and, and national peers in our current uh, classification. But that's still only 75% of students who start in their freshman year who make it to their sophomore year. So 25% of the students are they're either transferring out, they're, they're leaving the university for whatever reason. So if we can improve that, if we can improve that number, there's so many benefits that come from that. Not only from the university's perspective when it comes to sort of the fiscal responsibility and maintaining tuition levels, but also for the students. We, they, they trusted us to come to the university and to help them achieve their goals, the right to try kind of ideas that Dr. Harden was sharing. Um, you know, we, we, if we can serve them better and we can get more students through retention and through completion, then we have fewer people in our, in our communities who are without a degree and a pile of debt and, and a harder time taking care of that. So we recognize how this linkage all works and really felt like investing in student success was a big place where we can try to improve the outcomes for our students. And when I say we invested in student success, what we did with that, uh, some of that comes through my office and we invested in really strong uh, analytics capabilities. Some of the more recent data science kinds of techniques were sitting on mountains of data. We know what students have done as they come through the university for many years. How can we use that to better inform pathways through? We also invested in uh, advising staff we added, uh, I think we're at 12 new advisors in the last three years. Before that, we were at about nine advisors, so we more than doubled our advising staff to be able to consume some of the analytics, but also to work on strategies and to be able to be there for students when they need help. The retention committee has been really focused on reducing other barriers that get in the way to completion. Um, we, we pay attention to the research a lot and uh, watch for things like, there's, there's a lot of discussion around sense of belonging, homesickness at the beginning of those freshman years um, that really kind of pulls students away in those early weeks, the first six to eight weeks. So what can we do to get students invested in the university early on? We've also invested in things like the, um, the SISU Center, which is the new uh, Innovation Institute at NMU, which is focused on academic innovation, new programs, innovative programs, and delivery methods to be able to serve students in a number of different ways. <laughs> We're also looking at investing in broader partnerships to improve enrollment, transfer agreements, uh, relationships with other uh, Upper Peninsula and Downstate universities to create pathways to transfer in. Our admissions department has made investments in their, um, their tools. They have cutting edge sales and marketing solutions, so they're reaching a broader swath of students uh, and bringing in more applications that way. But we also, in my office, work closely with the admissions department to make sure that things like our admissions criteria are appropriate. So you may have heard in the last year or so that NMU eliminated the ACT and the SAT test. And that wasn't just one of those things that we just kind of did based on COVID, like a lot of institutions have done. They've, they've made it optional. For us, we started researching this before COVID and found that the ACT or the SAT test really didn't predict a whole lot when it came to student success, and what I mean by that is sort of their GPA at the end of their first term or their first year, or whether they make it through in that retention capacity to the beginning of their sophomore year. 
So when we took a look at the data, the ACT and SAT didn't really predict any of that for our students. So we know that there's equity uh, issues with the ACT and SAT, and we wanted to try to remove additional barriers to getting, uh, to allowing more students to come to the university. Uh, again, staying connected to our rural identity and developing initiatives like the UP Center for Rural Health, and Elise will talk about that a little later. Um, better understanding of rural economies, you'll see that showing up in a lot of our strategic planning documents now. And then really in the last couple of years, we've, we've doubled down on listening to our students, in particular during uh, COVID times. So, you know, we, we're hearing from them that issues related to mental health really are, um, uh, they're, they're something that we can't give up on. They're, they're only getting uh, bigger and, and more difficult for students, and in particular during COVID. Students are really focused on issues of social justice, diversity, equity, inclusion, and then also looking at um, getting additional post-graduation support, so helping them with that life after graduation. So th this is a really brief list. This is only the stuff that kind of comes to my mind. There are efforts all over campus to try to, you know, do everything we can to serve our students as best we can, and then also bring new students in because we know that that, that trend line is gonna be there, but it doesn't have to be the future for the university. That's sort of what we're fighting against. So what can we do to um, support uh, enrollment through a number of different initiatives? So there's a list of references. I'd be happy to share the slide deck if anybody wants to take a look at any of those later. Otherwise, we can open it up to questions. For yeah, Brian. absolutely. So if you have a question for either myself or for Jason, uh, please uh, uh, raise your hand and I'll let you use the microphone so that we can get it onto the streaming folks who are at home in their pajamas watching. Hi, you spoke about advising staff. Yeah. I know faculty sometimes advise the staff, but what in particular are you talking about when you talk about that dozen advising staff? So that was, there's a little bit of a change in the model of advising at the university. And, and the way that it used to be done was in the first year, students were advised through our ACAC, Academic Career and Advisement Center. I think I, I always get that acronym wrong. They were advised in their first year through the ACAC Center, and then they would, the students would transition into being advised by faculty in the departments. Um, but what we're finding is that the issues are so broad for students nowadays that they need help with that it goes beyond the scope of what faculty either you know, sometimes have the time for or the expertise in or the willingness to participate. I mean, faculty are always gonna be willing to help a student as best they can, but that might not be their best suited area. So, what we wanted to do was invest in a team of people who have the skills, who have the professional development opportunities to learn those strategies to best support the students, and then create the time for faculty to be able to do what they do best with the students, mentor them on career advice or you know, help them with content or whatever the case might be. So the advisors that were recently hired are embedded in the academic departments. They work alongside of those faculty. They're really me meant to be built in as part of that department and, and work with them hand in hand. So, there, we're, we're not de-investing from sort of that faculty mentorship in any way. It's just a complementary piece to help the student with some of the other broader issues. You bet. Are there any other questions? I'm going to date myself. Um, <laughs> I'm a retired school counselor. I retired 25 plus years ago. Back then, the NCAA had an ACT requ minimum requirement for athletes. I don't know if that's changed or not, but if that has changed, how does the fact that no Northern is eliminating the ACT as, a, in, as an admission requirement affecting the athletics? Yeah, there's only so much we can do there, right? The eligibility requirements are still the same for the NCAA. So in those situations, those students would have to provide those ACT and SAT scores. I believe this isn't my area of expertise. Um, hopefully, if that's the case, the NCAA will take a closer look at sort of what that means for those students. Part of the reason that we limited the ACT and SAT is what, what the research is telling us is students, many students get a, an advantage by being able to uh, access tutoring or other additional testing support that makes them perform better on the test itself and not necessarily the content of the ACT or the SAT. So when you take a look at what those scores look like on a student's way into the university, 
and whether or not it had anything to do with the re relationship with the student's performance during their time at the university, there just there isn't really anything predictive there. So there's a couple things to do, either fix the test, which we don't have a whole lot of control over, provide access for people who, who, if this is going to be a barrier, then give everybody an equitable playing field to be prepared for that test, or eliminate it and rely on other variables that are far more predictive. And what we found is high school GPA is just so, so much more predictive than ACT or SAT. Are there other, any other questions? Um, just to kind of follow up, yeah, athletics is part of Northern's attempt. It, I mean, Northern, Jason talks about some of the things that Northern is doing, trying to do. There's lots of other things, such as uh, expanding athletic programs mm -hmm. um, as a way to attract more students. I think one of the misconceptions a lot of people have about athletics is that every student who is on an, who's on an athletic team has a full athletic scholarship to come to Northern. Uh, in fact, that's the minority have full uh, scholarship. Some get like maybe a half or a quarter of a scholarship. Others are not getting any scholarship but are on the team just because they want to be on the team. So um, what it does is it does drive some attendance um, mm -hmm. from students uh, in, in certain sports that would uh, attract, you know, just translate into more students in the school. And, uh, we, and, and recently we started an eSports program which is actually uh, a gaming room down in the uh, Harden Hall, very nice gaming room, uh, to attract students because this is a new thing of online gaming um, and, uh, and a popular thing, uh, even a spectator sport. And uh, Northern is trying to attract students that way. So in many, many different ways, Northern is working to try to kind of buck this trend. And it has been for a while because it is real. And, uh, there's been a lot of discussion on campus of whether it's real or not. I know Jason's been taking a lot of the brunt of that of people saying, oh, no, 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 this is just scare tactics. <laughs> and uh, the numbers are the numbers. Yep. Um, and how Northern responds to that is going to be, uh, it's, it's all of these things, uh, including expanding um, facilities and creating better facilities for the university, this building being one of them, uh, this project uh, was really looking at a way of uh, expanding not only, uh, well, in increasing the m number of organizations that use it and uh, and improving the quality of those programs. So, I, how many of you remember going to concerts in the Great Lakes rooms, where the the ceiling was, <laughs> you know, just above your head? We've been dreaming of having something like this for a long time, and it yeah. it, uh, it really is uh, going to be a great addition. Yeah. So, are there any other questions? Just a follow-up too, Dan. Interestingly, the, yeah. the athletic students, the athletes on on campus, uh, typically have higher uh, retention rates and completion rates as well. They have additional requirements through NCAA, but that also ends up translating into higher performance. Um, so there's a number of different benefits beyond additional recruitment. That's a really great point. All right. Well, if there's no other uh, questions, we'll uh, wrap it up. Uh, the next session here is at 9:20. Uh, and it's going to be on rural health in the UP with Elise Berg, director of the Center for Rural Health. So we will convene at 920. Until then, get some coffee and have some sweets, and uh, we'll see you in a few.